Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Scott. I am an alcoholic. I love the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I, I, I always start out and tell people it has not always been like that, okay? I, uh, first off, I'd like to thank Chris for inviting me up here, and, and uh, it's a privilege and an honor to get to participate in a program, in a meeting, in a group that has structure. You know, you guys, um, I don't know if you really realize how good you have it here on the West Coast. Uh, there's a certain enthusiasm in Alcoholics Anonymous that I find on the West Coast, and, and I am from Utica, New York. My, my home group is the central group, uh, where we believe in sponsorship. We believe in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, the program of action that's outlined in it. We believe in the traditions. Now, they did not really realize that till I moved there four years ago, but <laughs> <laughs> that's another story. We'll get into that. You know, I, <clears throat> I'd like to g- congratulate the newcomers, the people that raised your hands in the first 30 days, and you know, I'll tell you that you're never going to have a better sobriety date than the one you got, so you might as well keep it, you know. And uh, you're never going to have the best story in AA, so you might as well keep that one too, okay. I, I believe people come into AA for two reasons and two re- reasons only. We come in for relief or we come in for recovery, you know. And uh, we learn to share our experience, strength, and hope and what it was like, what happened, and what it's like today. And, you know, I did not understand that I was in an absolute fight for my life. Most people don't. You know, most people that come in here, they don't understand. I didn't understand that I suffered from an allergy in my body coupled with the obsession of the mind, that it affected me spiritually, physically, and emotionally, and that when I put alcohol in my body, I'm trying to overcome an obsession that I have absolutely no control over, you know. And I didn't understand these things, and until such that such an understanding can be reached within me, there's little hope. You know, I'm doomed. The big book talks about that doomed, okay? Now, I did not start out like that, and my story is not the story of drinking out of a brown paper bag at the age of five. You know, I, uh, I grew up in Boston. I know we have people here from Boston and in the surrounding areas of Boston, and, and I grew up in the projects of Germantown and Quincy and South Boston, and, and um, you know, one of the, th- I, I believe I had a lot of the alcoholic traits before I even picked up my first drink. You know, uh, they talk about the selfishness, self-centeredness, the self-seeking, the self-pity, and characteristic traits that we have driven by the hundred forms of fear and self-delusion, making decisions based on me, which placed me in a position to be hurt by you. I had all the, a lot of those before I picked up my first drink. I was very rebellious. And I, uh, if you were a teacher, a babysitter, a uh, police officer, you tried to tell Scotty what to do, I would rebel at, uh, at it. You know, I grew up uh, Irish and Catholic, and you guys know when you're Irish and you're Catholic and you grow up in the neighborhood, you drink. And uh, the drinking age was 18. Uh, as my fr- friend Sean Mulkern talks about, the type of neighborhood that I grew up in is the type that if you had a heart condition and you went out and you told your friends that punch you in the chest just, just to see how bad it was, okay? <clears throat> so... You didn't show feelings and you didn't show emotions because if you were weak, people took advantage of you. That's really the bottom line, you know. I uh, I started, um, anybody go to Alateen? Anybody know? Okay, Alateen's a ch- uh, program for children of alcoholics. I used to take the trains into South Boston. My dad was that alcoholic roaring through the lives of the family. He talks about the warped lives of blameless wives and children and so forth. And, and, and my dad was that alcoholic. I didn't understand this disease of alcoholism. I didn't understand he was suffering from something he had no control over. I just didn't like the police always at my house and taking my dad away and him beating up my mom and stuff. And so I was going to this program called Alateen, and, and i got to tell you, I didn't get anything out of Alateen, not a thing out of Alateen. It was a place for me to go and manipulate and get you to feel sorry for Scotty. See, I didn't want anything out of Alateen. I really didn't want anything. You know, I went to Al-Anon with my mom. Any Al-Anons here? Got a few? Okay. We're still going to try to have fun. Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I love the program of Al-Anon. I really do. I love the program of Al-Anon. At the time, you know, now I'm talking 35 years ago in New England, there were no men in Al-Anon, okay? And when I went with my mom, they were all to me just a bunch of cackling old hens who sat around the table and complained about their husbands and the way they were being treated. My dad, being that alcoholic, would follow us to, you know, St. Anne's Church, sit down the street in his van drinking, and then follow it, follow us home. 
and proceed to beat my mom up and call her a whore and who was she meeting there and all those other things, you know. And she wasn't meeting anybody there. She was just trying to find a better way for her boys through this program of Al-Anon. And make no mistake that alcoholism is a family disease, okay. It affects all of us. We do become like tornadoes roaring through the lives of others. And I'm going to these things trying to find a better way and I'm starting to drink now at a young age. I'm 12 years old, turning 13, and the drinking age was 18 and I always hung around with older kids. It was real easy to get booze. And I had my first arrest when I was 12 years old, turning 13, for assault battery on a police officer and drunken disorderly conduct. And I got sentenced to Alcoholics Anonymous for myself. Now, I'm just turning 13 years old, and my first sobriety date was January 18, 1973. You know, and uh, I went into the Quincy Bay Group in Quincy, Massachusetts, right on Hancock Street in Wollaston. And uh, it was a young people's group. And the youngest young person in the room was like 30. Okay. And, and they talked about losing cars and homes and going to jail. And I didn't even have a driver's license. Okay. I'm not relating to these people. I wasn't looking for that recovery. I was looking for relief. And when I say relief was to get my mom off my back and the courts off my back. Okay. And I'm just going in there playing a the game. Just leave me alone. And one day I'm going to be okay. You know, I did not believe that I was an alcoholic. I didn't, uh, I had never heard anything about the book. We were talking about this at dinner, and that was a great dinner, you know, but we were talking about different customs all around the country because they really didn't read from the book. They had what was called commitments in this group here, the West Portland group, and it's wonderful. This is my first time in Portland. Thank you for the hospitality, West Portland. It's, you know, it's wonderful. I didn't know it rained so much around here. Uh, <laughs> I spent the night last night in Astoria where I guess it rains 236 inches a year out there. And uh, that, that was great. Um, <laughs> it was. It was good. It reminded me of Cape Cod. But um, the customs that they do, you know, they, they have commitments, okay? And a commitment would be like the West Portland group here would take a panel and they would go to another group and put on their meeting. You at your own group don't even share. You couldn't even share anyway if you had, unless you had 90 days and you could go on these panels, but you couldn't participate in anything. And, and unless you, and the main thing was meetings, 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 makers, makers. Just come to meetings and don't drink and you'll be okay. I never heard anything about the steps. I never heard anything about working a program or, or reading the big book or anything like that. And I got on that vicious cycle. And in Chapter 3, more about alcoholism, it talks about the experimentation, the self-deception, that we try to prove ourselves exceptions to the rule, therefore non-alcoholic. And even at that young age, I kept going out there defending my right to drink, okay, because I couldn't possibly be an alcoholic, okay? You know, I started making the rounds to the homes of the bewildered, as my friend Jim Buckley talks about, and that's getting strapped to beds, getting pumped full of Thorazine, lithium, chloral hydrate, Haldol, all these wonderful things. I was diagnosed as suicidal, homicidal, manic depressive, you know, and, and um, just off that subject real quick, i got to tell you, I was misdiagnosed, okay? <laughs> What I am is an alcoholic, okay? Those are a lot of common manifestations of that uniqueness that we have because we're all terminally unique, okay? But I'm being diagnosed all these different things, getting strapped to beds in Medfield State Hospital and in, in, in Massachusetts and the Mattapan Rehab and Tom Chuck and all these different things. I was uh, on Skid Row at 16 eating out of dumpsters and trash cans at the Pine Street Inn in Boston. Um, and my attitude was, if you just leave me alone, I'll be okay, you know? One day I'm going to be a millionaire. One day I'm, I'm going to be a rock and roll star. One day this, one day that. You know, just leave me alone because I'm in a world I don't belong. And you hear speakers get up here and talkers that talk about that stuff. But these are real feelings and, and emotions because I was just in a world I didn't belong. And, and I'm coming into these rooms of AA and I'm not finding the solution. You know, and you hear people get up and talk about the common solution, and, and, and they don't even know what the common solution is. And the common solution is the spiritual experience or spiritual awakening, if you please, as the result of the steps. And I'm not hearing the message. I'm hearing just come to meetings and don't drink, and I can't stop drinking. See, drinking's my solution. Drinking's the answer. I got that spring inside me that just keeps going down and down and down, and drinking is the solution. My problem is not the drinking. My problem is when I'm not drinking, okay, because I'm angry and I'm violent and, and I just don't belong here. And so I heard something. I heard get a sponsor. Find a sponsor. So I'm sitting in. I'm 16 years old. I'll never forget because you guys just, just did your, your chips and your medallions there. And how it worked in Massachusetts, they don't sing happy birthday. They don't give you a cake. Um, what's your name? No, you. Rich. Let's say Rich is my sponsor, Okay. Sorry, ma'am. <laughs> men with the men and the girls with the girls. No. So Rich is my sponsor, okay? Rich would get up here and talk and tell you about me. And he would talk for a couple minutes and tell you all the things I've done in the last year of my sobriety. 
the community involvement I've had and everything, and then I would accept a medallion, okay? And and I'm sitting out there, and this guy, Fred, he was one of the youngest young persons in the group. He's getting a four-year anniversary medallion, and he got up here, his sponsor got up here and said all this wonderful stuff about Fred and all the stuff he had done in the last year. And then Fred got up, and I'll never forget it because he stood there and he's looking at his medallion and he said, you know, I was really nervous this morning when I woke up because I knew I was going to have to get up here in front of all you people. So I smoked a joint to take the edge off. Okay? <laughs> and, and, and so, so Fred went on, okay? And, <laughs> And the meeting got over, and I got to tell you, I love what Fred had to say, okay? So so that meeting got over, and I went right up to Fred, and I asked Fred to be my sponsor, okay? <laughs> We're not stupid people, okay? And, um, you know, I thought, I honestly thought that that was okay. See, drugs were an outside issue, Okay? You did not get up here and talk about drugs, period. I, I saw many of people that would get up here and talk this years ago, get up here and start talking about drugs. You never identified as an and or, whether you're an and or overeater or addict or whatever. You were just, it was Alcoholics Anonymous, period. And if you got up here and you started talking about drugs, people would pull you up. Literally, I physically pull you off the podium. You don't talk about that stuff, right? That's an outside issue. So my point here is I had a lot of misconceptions on what AA was, okay? Now, make no mistake, years later, when I talk about years later, when I finally read the book, when I finally took the prescription that's outlined in the book, Dr. Silkworth closes all those loopholes. When he talks about that, that there, there's the only cure that we have to offer really is entire abstinence, that we can't take anything, okay? And, and I missed that because I never read the book, okay? And uh, so I'm, I'm, bottom line here is I'm on, on that vicious cycle going in and out, jackpot after jackpot, trouble after trouble. I'm in DYS, the Division of Youth Service Board. Uh, which is like a YA in California, a youth authority. Um, um, I'm uh, going into drug and alcohol rehabilitation programs, the type that shaved your head and made you wear dunce caps and sit on the bench and clean dumpsters with toothbrushes and that demoralizing degradation trying to tear you down. I went into the scared straight program uh, with, in Walpole State Prison, Bill Ricker, Bridgewater, all this, where you go in and these big convicts with tattoos all over them, and they say, give me your shoes. Says, well, I'm going to bend you over. And they start telling you what they're going to do to you when they get you in, right? And, uh, you know, <laughs> it wasn't funny at the time. <laughs> and, and they're telling me what they're going to do for me. So we're not stupid. I started, I became what you call a mule, and I started smuggling drugs into these guys, Hacksaw and Chainsaw and Shotgun Kelly and all the, you know, that were trying to scare me straight. I'm running drugs into them, okay, uh, because it was a game to me. It, it, was, it was like a game to me. I still, I didn't belong in these things. You know, and you know it, got, it gets worse, never better, and we're like the boys whistling in the dark, and, and uh, it's just nothing is working for me. Uh, I ended up getting a girl pregnant, bottom line here, I quit high school in January of my senior year, and uh, I figured I'd settle down and do the responsible thing. That lasted two weeks. And, uh, you know, I didn't need her anyway. That's the attitude we portray when really I was just, I was devastated. And, and I found myself in the combat zone in Boston in the red light district, and a few buddies of mine, we started rolling prostitutes, and if you don't know what that is, it's robbing them, okay? And I, I ended up getting arrested for armed robbery as an adult, and I went into the Charles Street Jail, which is the oldest jail in New England. It's five tiers, and I walked in like that Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder movie, Stir Crazy, you know, that's right, we bad. And I walked in, and a guy got thrown off the fifth tier, and he got killed, and it absolutely scared me to death. You know, I had heard about all those things that happened in these penitentiaries and stuff, and, and I... uh you know, I, I was scared. I, they, I was scared, you know, and, and it's Massachusetts. I got to tell you this real quick because it's a, a commonwealth law state. I don't know what it is here in Oregon, but you have the right to face your accuser. And if your accuser doesn't show up three times, they dismiss it lack of prosecution. So I'm facing eight to 10 years in Walpole State Prison. I ended up getting bailed out. I went to my dingy apartment and this is where they talk in the big book about the jumping off point where we can't see life with alcohol or without. And that, what they're talking about is it, it, what it says is that there will be those of us that choose to make the supreme sacrifice 
sacrifice them to continue the fight. It's talking about suicide. These are when the dark side and the, and, and the suicidal thoughts start coming in because I'm feeling like I've tried just about everything. And I, and I went home, and I won't get into it. If you got any of those issues and you want to talk to me afterward, that's fine. But I ended up cutting my wrists all the way down and bled out, and that's how they found me the next day. And I came out of it on the critical list five days later. Um, and, and they didn't, you know, they didn't know if I'd ever use my hands again because they had to do all the exploratories and bring my veins back down. And uh, I still continued to drink. You know, I ended up beating that case, and I had another suicide attempt. And uh, I ended up going out to Medfield State Hospital, and and uh, this woman came and saw me, and she told me about this guy named Jesus Christ, that if I accepted him as my personal Savior, that behold, everything would be new. And I had grown up Irish and Catholic, and I had an, an aunt that was a nun, and I had a grandmother that told me she was going to castrate me. I didn't even know what the word meant, but she was going to castrate me if I kept going the way I was doing. Now, you, you know, and years later when I found out about it, it scared me. But, uh, <laughs> but she's telling me this, so I got this scary God who's keeping a record, and I'm being thrown into the lake of fire. Now she's telling me about this uh, uh, nice God that's forgiving and loving and and uh, if I accepted them, that, that behold, everything would be new. And alcoholics, you know, we go from one extreme to the next. And so I ended up doing that. And I ended up going to this program called Teen Challenge. And I quit swearing, smoking, watching TV, listening to rock and roll. I started going to Bible studies five hours a day, church seven days a week, giving my testimony how Christ had saved my life. I'd come into halls like this and, and the, and the born-again Christians would be you know, talking in tongues and passing out. And I'm that square peg just trying to fit. I'm just trying to be a part of and, and I want to be a part of. And so I decided I'm going to get filled with the spirit and I would do it and I'd fall down. And I, I was, I was hurting my neck and my back and <laughs> I was getting hurt. These guys weren't getting hurt, right? So we're quick, we're quick studies. And so I, I figured, okay, well, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to talk in tongues. And so now, <laughs> You gotta follow me, right? I'm three months into this program, right? You know, and I have, I'm friggin', I'm crazy. You know, I haven't gone through the process, right? Okay. So, I start talking in tongues, and now mind you, I'm making this up, okay? So follow me. Now Bob over here starts interpreting what the Spirit's telling him that I'm saying, right? Okay. So, now I know he's a hypocrite, right? Because I'm making it up. So he's making it up, and he's full of crap. Now you're all full of crap. See, now this this is my throne of judgment that I'm on. Okay. See, now you're all full of crap. And what it what it, what it was was I woke up in the morning, and I had this moment of clarity. Okay. And and, and what it was for me is like that cup of coffee. You you could take that cup of coffee and 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 go in and put it under nice, cool, clear liquid and drip water into it and come back an hour from now and it's still dark and dirty on the inside. Okay, it's dark. That's what I was on the inside. I was dark and dirty. Unconsciously, the way the big book is written from the doctor's opinion to page 63 deal with a couple of things and they're basically conclusions of the mind that I'm alcoholic, my, you know, my life's unmanageable. Unmanageability simply means not achieving one's purpose. I fully concede into the innermost self, okay? I could see that through my, my track record. Coming to believe that this power could restore me to sanity. It's talking about the insanity of the first drink. It's really not talking about the sanity of the world. Making the decision to turn my will and my life my thoughts and my actions over this care of God. Okay, so I'm going through these. But what I had never done, ever, was a fearless and thorough moral inventory of myself, let alone admit it to somebody. And what happened was I woke up and I knew I was still dark and dirty on the inside because I had done a lot of bad things, okay? And I love it when, when people come in here and they say, we're not bad people, we're just sick people trying to get better. And that's true and that's okay, but I did a lot of bad things, okay? And, and I was trying to do some good things. And it was time that I did some good things. And Chuck C. used to talk about trying to write a record. Okay, And I'm trying to get this balance sheet going, and I'm trying to do right things. Or I love it when people come in here and they say that they're sensitive. Now, the big book does say that. Okay, It really does tell me afterwards and stuff. It says that the alcoholic is sensitive. But the very next sentence says that it takes some of us a long time to overcome this serious handicap. Okay, <laughs> It's not an asset. My sensitivity is not an asset. And, and, and you hear it because I'm the same way, you know, because I'm so unique and different. Please don't say anything that will hurt my feelings because I might drink, right? Okay. If I'm honest, and this is what I'm trying to be as honest, if I'm honest about it, I'm as, I'm as sensitive as a rhinoceros, okay? You know, when I drank, I'd stick a gun in your face and take your money. I'd screw your wife. I'd burglarize your home. I'd do whatever I had to do to drink. And then I come into AA or these programs like this, and I'm go, oh, don't hurt my feelings, okay? You know? <laughs> I might drink, okay? That was a bunch of crap. And, and so 
I'm full of crap, and I go to the director of the program, and i got to get this stuff out of me. And he doesn't want to hear it. See, he, he just didn't want to hear it. He, he believed through the biblical sense that I was forgiven, and now it's time to move on. Uh, he didn't understand the concept of the uncovering, the discovering, and the discarding, all this stuff, that what was in me was like gangrene, and if I didn't get it out, it was going to absolutely kill me. You know, and, and we got into this argument, and defiance came back. And that's one of the things that our steps in the 12 and 12 talking defiance being one of my chief character traits. And I told him what he could do with his program, and I walked away. And I went back into the same projects, the same acquaintances, not with the conviction that I was going to drink. I wasn't going to drink no more. I'm just going to smoke a little weed. Now, remember, and I'm not saying that to dis disrespect Alcoholics Anonymous. I am, I am well-versed at the traditions, and I adhere to the traditions. This is the experience. And I'm not a guy up here and say, well, I'm going to talk about drugs because that's my experience. Oh, crap. Okay, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm telling you my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous because that's, I honest to God, thought through sponsorship that that was okay, that marijuana maintenance. And it, this is a guy that was not properly armed with the facts about himself, let alone the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. See, make no mistake, I am not an expert in alcoholism, okay? I am not in any way, shape, form, in the imagination an expert in alcoholism. What I'm well-versed at now, though, is a 12-step program of recovery that goes through the process of uncovering, discovering, and discarding that gets the alcoholic to come back from the gates of insanity and death because I've become properly armed with the facts about me. Not everything else out there. And I'm under these false perceptions of reality and even what Alcoholics Anonymous is. What I didn't realize was that I had heard a saying way back in the early 70s is that a man takes a drink, the drink takes a drink, and the drink takes the man. Okay? And it was just a matter of time, as we all know, we succumb to that drink, as so many of us do, and I took that drink. And then the drink took the drink, and the drink took me one more time. And I'm a blackout drinker. Any blackout drinkers here? <laughs> All right, I'm talking some way. Well, I would wake up in the morning and I would, you know, be told what I did, and I'd have bags of money and telephones, and I'm doing all this stuff and <clears throat> weird things. And um, you know, it, it, I had reached that point, that jumping-off point, one more time because I thought I had tried AA, I thought I had tried psychology, I thought I had tried all these other things, and and. I found myself, to make a long story short, November 14, 1979, I'm sitting on this bridge called the Bourne Bridge in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, okay? And it's um, 169 feet up, and I climbed up there, and uh, uh, it was a big drama. You know, the, the Corps of Engineers and Coast Guard were down below me, and the Good Samaritan Suicide Prevention League was talking to me on bullhorns, and state police had the bridges blocked off, and and uh, the SWAT team, every time they come close to me, I'd say, don't do it, I'll jump, I'll jump. And they'd back away, you know, it's this big drama. And um, underneath is this campground called the Bourne Scenic Park. And all the campers came out and set up lawn chairs and stuff. And <laughs> <laughs> it's a true story. And they're yelling at me, jump, you motherfucker, jump, right? <laughs> I'm on this bridge going, oh, my God, these guys are crazy. Don't they know if I jump, I'm going to die, right? And these are the things I'm thinking, right? Because it's all about me, you know. And, I, and I'm, I, I am so flawed and ashamed and defective and unlovable and all the things that we hear about, and I'm so alone, you know. And they say this is a disease of loneliness. And, and there's even a story in our book talking about the keys of the kingdom, that loneliness deep down that nothing could touch. And I'm just so alone and different. And I'm full of resentment. Resentment. Re the Latin word, recentari, rethink, refill, replay. I'm doing all this in my mind. And I'm thinking about my life. And I'm, I'm not thinking good things about being a Boy Scout and being trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind of obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. I sure remember that stuff, right? <laughs> good things that people tried to teach me. I'm not, I'm not thinking about saving this kid's life when I was eight years old and being honored by the House of Representatives in Massachusetts and getting a plaque. I'm thinking about my dad being drunk and not showing up and me on a stage all alone and nobody there with me. And I'm thinking about coming home from school uh, one day and having my dad meet me at the door and, uh, he grabbed me and he had a milk jug with the top cut off and he escorted me to my room and I knew there was a problem because there was a lock on the outside of the door and he put me in and gave me the milk jug and locked me in from the outside and the, the room was so dark I couldn't see and I found the light and I, I turned it on and my whole window had been sheet metal and riveted and uh, he would let me out in the morning to go to school and lock me in at night. You know, I'm thinking of those thoughts, okay? Um, I'm not thinking positive love and tolerance and, and all these things we learn in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, 
you know, we were talking about Bob Darrell a little earlier, and Bob and I are good friends, and, and we talk about that self-absorption because I'm on me, and I can't get me off of me, okay? And that's what it was. And uh, I'm up there four and a half hours in this big drama and, and trying to find a better way, and, and I realized, you know what, I really don't want to die. I really don't want to die. There's got to be something out here for me. And I made the conscious decision to get down. So I stood up to get down, and I tell this story to show the cunning, baffling, and powerfulness of this disease of alcoholism. Because the next thought, and this was a real thought, and it was an honest thought, the next thought that jumped into my head was, you know what, Scotty? If you get down, you're going to look like a pussy to all these people that have waited all this time. <laughs> you got to jump. <laughs> so I turned and I jumped, okay? I don't remember hitting. Okay, I, uh, they say I died. They say I was dead for 13 and a half minutes. The only bone I broke was my sternum bone and chest cavity, and that was from them giving me the precardial thumbs, bringing me back to life, okay? Uh, th there's actually been uh, 20, 22 people that have jumped that bridge to date. They got all the suicide prevention league bars up there now, but 19 died. One was a paraplegic, one was a quadriplegic, and I'm the only person that, uh, that has actually survived that bridge, okay, and then there was one after me uh, that I'll get later in the story, but then he died, and they got these suicide prevention league bars up there, you know, and uh, I was in uh, the hospital strapped to beds and all the brain things like they do the exorcist, they didn't know if I'd talk right or if I had brain damage and all that, and I knew I was all right, you know, and to make a long story short, nothing worked, I, I left Massachusetts, to try the army, I went into the military, and uh, what I needed I thought was discipline, <laughs> well, the book says we're undisciplined, right, okay. I didn't read it, though. Anyway, so I, I joined out of Pennsylvania. My Army career was six months. They, I was, uh, they called me down for the count trainer. I was on the Benning House program of alcoholism, taking antabuse every morning in front of the CO. I had four Article 15s. Anybody ever try to drink on antabuse? Yeah, I know. Our cases are different, huh? Oh, I thought I was going to die. Uh, I ended up getting, because uh, 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 I lied about everything going into the service, and naturally when they found everything about, about me, they ended up letting me out real quick. And uh, gave me an honorable tra Chapter 5 uh, discharge. I came out, and just to make a long story short, because there's sobriety in my story here, I decided to come to California, the land of golden opportunity, Beverly Hills, Hollywood. You know, there's gold in them there, mines. I'm going to come out to California and all that. And I got out here on January uh, 9th, 1981, and January 16th, I came out of a blackout in L.A. County Jail. Okay. And I heard a saying real quick, and that was that you come on vacation and you leave on probation, right? <laughs> and that, <laughs> that's what they told me. And um, the, the, only, the only problem was I, I wasn't going anywhere, okay? And, and before it was all over between L.A. County, San Bernardino County, and Riverside County, I had 22 years in the state penitentiary in California. This is when Governor Brown was the governor, Jerry Brown, okay? And uh, I walked into the California penitentiaries, and my attitude was, if you weren't white, you weren't right, you know? And that, that's the bottom line I had. I was very racial. I grew up in Boston, one of the most racial capitals of the country in the 70s. We had forced busing and, and stuff, and uh, it was very racial and very violent. And these were hates and prejudices that I was taught and that I learned, and I, I brought them right into the penitentiaries with me, and I rode really hard. And understand that prison is nothing but a human kennel that breeds violence, okay? That's all it is. It's a human kennel that breeds violence, and I let it breed the violence in me, and I became an absolute animal. I had no hope. And I rode really hard and uh, hurt people, got hurt myself, and, and uh, all that happy horse crap. And I ended up uh, going up to this institution called Tehachapi, and I got invited to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and was asked if I'd like to go, and I, and I, and I went. And I sat in the back, and I had my bonnaroos on and my bandana, and I was sitting there, and uh, they started the meeting, and they read a portion of Chapter 5 from the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous on how it works. And I said, wow, that's powerful. I wonder where they're getting that, okay? <laughs> it's true. I really thought that, okay? Because I'd been in AA 10 years. I'd never heard it. They don't do readings in Massachusetts. They don't have to. See, the customs that you guys have out there, out here, are phenomenal. And I'm here in Chapter 5 for the first time. Then I hear, hear Chapter 3, and they're talking about the experimentation, the self-deception we're trying to prove. And I'm thinking, that's me. Where are they getting this stuff? And then... This guy got up, and his name was Eddie Miracle. And I'm, I'm cynical, and I'm sitting in the back going, oh, that's a cute AA name, Eddie Miracle, right? <laughs> well, that was really his name, okay? And uh, Eddie started sharing, and he started just like this. He said, if you're new, you've come home. You need never be alone again. You're like the prodigal son who had to venture out there, and now you're home. He started talking spiritual truths as our glass being half empty or half full. He started talking how we're all children of God. 
and for me to love you for your color or you not for your color, that there's no room for hypocrites in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Either we're all God's kids or none of us are. Okay. He started talking a lot about Chuck Chamberlain and Chuck C. Okay. And, and I don't, I don't know about you, but I felt like, like, you know, it was passing me by this luck and, and I reached up and I grabbed onto it. Okay. Uh, because people all my life told me what a piece of crap I was and what I wouldn't do and what I wouldn't become. And, and all of a sudden I'm sitting in this room and you, you people are telling me what I can do and what I can become if I'm willing to put forth the effort and work for it. Okay. You know, and the meeting got over and, uh, they read a vision for you. And I thought, man, this is really powerful. Where are they getting this stuff? And I've come to some fundamental ideas since that time. And that's simply if you want to hide something from the alcoholic, you put it in the big book. Okay? <laughs> they'll, ne- <laughs> they'll never find it because we never read it, right? And so I jumped into AA like my very life depended on it. I went back to school. I got my GED. I got four years of college behind me. I worked the steps. I've got a sponsor. All the promises, not only the nine-step promises, but all the promises started coming true for me, even inside the walls. And I started becoming a gentleman, a gentle man, okay? And I started treating fellow human beings as I wanted to be treated, that golden rule, okay? And I learned these hates and prejudices that I had were taught to me. And if you've got a little kid, and I have many of them, you can take them and throw them up in the air, and they have the complete faith, hope, trust, love in the world. I'm going to catch them. I'm not going to drop them on their head, okay? And we all had that. Each and every one of us sitting in this room had that same faith, hope, love, trust in the world. And then I grew up in the environment, and I grew up in the giving, gimme, gimme, take, 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 first come, first serve, early bird gets the worm. I don't care what you call it, but it's all selfish, self-centered stuff. If I, if I don't do it, somebody else is going to do it, and I learned all this stuff. So for me, it was really a process of unlearning a lot of that stuff, not so much learning all the new stuff, but unlearning a lot of the stuff that I was taught and that I grew up with, okay? Um, you know, I ended up uh, uh, meeting, meeting a girl, and... Uh, I ended up rolling all the laws changed, and, and I, I went to the I was told I, I owed, uh, if I wanted to stay sober, I owed myself a meeting, not a weekend in the hotel. Very first day I got out, I went to the Raptors in Newhall. I started my walk in sobriety. I got commitments. I, uh, um, H&I, I was going into the prisons. I, I became what you call a circuit speaker. I uh, started traveling all over the country, sharing my experience, strength, and hope with you. I got married on the program. I, 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 got, I was a speaker in Beaver, Utah, came off the, um, the uh, podium right into the wedding service. Uh, some of you may remember the biker group, the fifth chapter. Uh, they were all there. I had 300 of the brothers there, and and uh, everybody everybody was there, and, and uh, it was a wonderful thing. And I joined that rock and roll band that I always wanted to join, and and I became a, a lead singer in a couple different bands. And um, I bought a house in Valencia, and I. I had an attorney service in Los Angeles, and I built a custom home on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and I would fly between L.A. and Boston four or five times a month, getting picked up by limousines and chauffeured wherever I wanted. I mean, this program really worked. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I had a double-digit sobriety at the time. You know, I, um, I had 12-step my wife into the program. She got 22 years now. I married her when she had 90 days sober. You know, they say you don't do that, and, uh, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> no, just, just, just kidding, honey, we're still married. Uh, <laughs> you have five kids. Anyway, we're grandparents, so I'll talk about that in a minute. But, yeah, yeah I live in the dream of Alcoholics Anonymous, okay? And I, and I got to tell you, though, see, because we work the steps. We have that spiritual awakening. We have the spiritual experience, okay? Uh, my story, though, is not the story of unhappily ever after. Okay, I may be a little different uh, talker or speaker, if you please, uh, up here, because what happened to me was I started giving these steps away one at a time. And having had the spiritual awakening, as the result of these steps, we try to carry this message, the message of hope, the promise of the freedom of the bondage itself, right? Okay. Well, I wasn't doing that anymore. I was carrying Scotty's message. Look at me. Look at where I come from. Look at where I am now. Money, property, prestige, right? Okay. I wasn't seeking through prayer and meditation anymore, okay, to improve this conscious contact with God. Okay, I'm not continuing to take personal inventory. I owe a lot of people amends again. The character defects are coming back in force. I believe we lose a lot of people in Alcoholics Anonymous on step in six and seven because they're probably two of the least understood steps in our whole program because there are only two little paragraphs in our big book, and we breeze right through them, okay? And unbeknownst, alcoholism, alcohol is a subtle foe. 
And it's coming back on me, and I don't even realize it. See, and I believe in AA, you're going one of two ways. You're going towards a drink or you're going away from a drink. And for a lot of years there, I'm starting to go towards a drink through compromising the principles, the moralities, the things that this program gives us, okay, through justifications and rationalizations. Um, you, you, could, you could beat this to a dead horse, but you can talk about sex. The book says that God alone is our judge. Who are you to judge me, right? You know, and I'm using these mental masturbations, I call it, to justify and rationalize the lifestyle that I was living, getting up here, practicing what I call a program of hypocrisy, professing a belief in a system in a 12-step, in a way out, okay, that out, act, act, absolutely transforms alcoholics. We're the only people in, that I know of that get to live two lifetimes in a single lifetime. And think about that. We really do. We get to live two lifetimes in a single lifetime. And then walking out the door and doing something totally different. You know, and every time I do, it's like, oh, it's like killing my spirit, okay? But the ego and the arrogance and the pride can't tell you what's really going on with me. And my sponsor moved, and I don't need a sponsor. I know enough about AA. I know the book. I know this. I know that. The delusion, cunning, baffling, powerful, patient. And so I'm giving these back, okay? They say we only become as sick as our secrets, and I started becoming real sick in Alcoholics Anonymous. But you didn't know that, okay? Because you can get parrots up here real easy that know the words and can do that, okay, and talk out the sides of their neck and walk out the door and do something, and that's what I was doing. So the insanity is returning, okay? You know, you, you get down, I, I'm, I'm, I'm as dark as my secrets. Making that decision to turn my will and my life, my thoughts and my actions over this care of God was not there anymore because, as my friend said, it's hard for one God to recognize another God. Okay? Okay? See? It's hard for one God to recognize another God. And so so I'm, I'm in this insanity my will in my life, my thoughts and my actions, in the 12 and 12, it says that the 12 steps are a set of principles spiritual in, in their nature that if practiced as a way of life can expel the obsession and leave the sufferer usefully and happily whole. I was not usefully and happily whole anymore. Okay? It says in the third step that the rest of my program depends upon how earnestly I do that and continue. Use the word continue. Continue. Well, I wasn't doing that either. And make no mistake, if you don't get anything other than the hope that we give here, and what I'm going to say right now, because the big book specifically says the insanity returns and then we drink. It does not say we drink and then we get insane. It says the insanity returns and then we drink. And I was insane. I was absolutely insane. But you couldn't tell me that. You couldn't tell it by looking at me. Okay? Because we're actors, right? I have a certain reputation that I want you to perceive me as. In my heart, I know I don't deserve it. But I have this aura, I, I have this reputation, and you gotta, you know, I can't tell you. Can't tell you these things. So the insanity's back. It says we have no defense against the first drink except in a few, few rare occasions. That's willpower. And for a lot of years, I'm going all willpower, okay? And the bottom line here is I drank. And I turned my back on Alcoholics Anonymous, you people, my family, I walked away from everything, okay? Not, it was not a slip. This is not a relapse meeting. It wasn't a slip. Okay, I didn't slip. I wanted a drink more than I wanted to stay sober. Okay, because I hated myself. I didn't like the way I felt. Okay, I didn't like the way I felt. I didn't have to drink if I was honest and willing enough to do this thing that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Okay, if I was honest and willing enough to really try this thing and, and, and through sponsorship and commitments and a home group and all these things that I had been lacking all of a sudden. Okay, uh, I didn't have to drink. I didn't ever have to drink again. You don't ever have to drink one day at a time for the rest of your life, ever. That's what Al a Alcoholics Anonymous did back in the 30s, 40s, 50s when they had a 93% success rate. They made commitments for the rest of their lives one day at a time. And I think we've lost a lot of that stuff on really why we're here and what we're trying to do and what we're trying to become. Um, through a lot of the stuff that's been brought into our fellowship from outside sources that Dr. Bob talked about in 1950 that really have little to do with the actual work that we're trying to do here. Okay, We can't get caught, caught up in all these Freudian philosophies of the day. But we do. Okay, And I did. And I'm just as, and I'm just as guilty. And I drank and, and, and not thinking I was an alcoholic. I knew I'm an alcoholic. I just, I just didn't want to feel anymore. And uh, I didn't want to kill myself either, you know what I mean? I didn't want to take that chicken shit way out. And um, I ended up, uh, you know, it says in the steps that, that it's, a, it's an act that both nature and God abhor. 
okay? Meaning he doesn't like it, okay? And uh, so I decided to drink instead of instead of killing myself, and, and I walked away from everything, and in a short order, in short order, I was down to 129 pounds, doing all those things, drinking daily, could not stop drinking, wanted to stop drinking, could not stop drinking. I know what it's like to come in here with you guys that raise your hands with 10, 11 days and make a decision, I don't want to drink anymore, and then walk out the door and get drunk anyway. Now, a big book refers to this as this type of thinking that when it's fully established in the alcoholic, he's probably beyond human aid. And then unless locked up, he may die or go permanently insane. See, now all of a sudden I'm in this, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to overcome. The, I, what, it, what it is that I talk about, I released the gorilla, okay, the gorilla. And when you got that gorilla on your back, if you've ever made love to a gorilla, <laughs> okay, that's like drinking, okay? You ain't done till the gorilla's done, okay? That's really it, okay? <laughs> you ain't done, okay? And so, so, so I got the gorilla on me, and I'm coming, I'm coming into AA, and I'm raising my hand as a newcomer, okay? And, and, but the, the, the arrogance and ego in me is, you know, I've forgotten more than you're ever gonna learn. I know more about this program. Now, some of the sick ones, that, you know, I sponsor people 20 years sober and stuff. Some of the some of the sick ones that I'd heard their inventory, they're running up to me. Oh, can I be your sponsor now, right? Oh, that would kill me. I'd walk out the door and I'd get drunk. That would kill me. That ego, that arrogance, that pride. I'm on this vicious cycle and I'm trying to overcome the obsession I got no control over. And I, I'm not honest and willing enough to do this. I'm not teachable anymore. Okay? And uh, Christmas night... Uh, 1996, uh, away from my family and everything, my business is gone. I had several restaurants at the time, and um, in the depths of despair, the jumping off point, can't pitch your life with or without alcohol. All these things are back on me again. Again. And I took a pistol, a 25 automatic, and I shot myself, boom, put it right to my head, and I pulled the trigger And uh, on Christmas night, 1996. And three days later, I came out on... Uh, full life support systems in the hospital bed, full life support systems, and I was coming out of it, and uh, they didn't know whether I'd talk or walk or anything again, and I continued to drink, okay? And what happened to me uh, is the state of California stepped in, and uh, they filed charges on me for ex-felon with a gun. <laughs> That's a true story. They, uh, they, had, they had what was called a three-strike law, and uh, they ruled that I had nine felony convictions. They ruled that this was going to be my fourth strike, and they remanded me into custody. They charged me with ex-felon with a gun, felony possession of a, a firearm. And just to make that story short, before it was all over, I'm sitting in Chino State Prison, okay? I'm in the hole. They're striking me out, giving me 25 to life, okay? And I had another thought, okay? And I have these thoughts, okay? And the thought that popped into my head, the, no, really, the thought that popped into my head that time was, I want to be sober now, right? Okay, okay. I'll work the steps now, okay? I'll get a sponsor, I'll get a home group now, right? And I'm in there, they're giving me 25 to life. I'm the joke of the institution, okay? They're calling me Gramps and stuff in there now, right? And, uh, that really wasn't funny then. <laughs> it really wasn't. I was, I mean, they're taking me to the warden. They inter the psychiatrist introduced me to the warden, and this is how he introduced me. This is the guy, right? Okay. This is the guy. All these heavy-duty convicts that are lifers and getting struck out and killing people and all this other stuff. What are you in here for? I shot myself in the head, right? It was terrible. You talk about reputation. It was terrible, okay? Now, they say we don't regret the past and wish to shut the door on it, and I was very violent and racial in my past, and I found myself in a jackpot, and I found myself put in the hole, okay? And I was in the hole for 28 days. And I got a hold of a piece of paper and a pencil because I know a little bit about the history of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I know a little bit about where we come from, from the Oxford group and going back to the Washingtonians and the love intolerance and all these things. And I, and I took my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous trying to come in and trying to get sober. How many, how many people here have tried AA more than once? Let's just say this is not your first time, okay? You, you've tried it a couple times, okay? Now, how many people have, tr this is your first time you came in, you got sober, and you're still sober? Okay, I want all you guys to look at these people because that's how you're supposed to do it, okay? Um, but, well, you are, okay? 
In the forward of the second edition, it talks about 50% of us got sober in states over 25 after some relapses came back. But back in the day, they actually had a 93% success rate. And I wrote this thing that, that because I knew how hard it was going to be for someone like me with such a tremendous ego and arrogance to come back into these rooms and raise my hand. And I wrote this thing that when one who has wandered far into selfishness and self-centeredness seek to return to the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, he will encounter criticism and distrust. There will be those that whisper, he's a newcomer again. I don't think he'll make it this time either. You know, these wicked ones are doing not the work of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous or of their higher power, but of their own selfish, self-centered interests. They seek to drive the returning member still farther from hope and from sobriety. You know, let the returning member contemplate the rejoicing in heaven over the return of the one that was lost. Let him in no way be disheartened by the suspicion and scorn of others. He can again walk in the sunlight of the Spirit. See, because that's what I felt. This program was founded off love and tolerance, not the judgment and condemnation we get sometimes around here. Okay, it was founded off love and tolerance, and that's what I felt and that's what I believed. And and you know I got back into AA in there and started as Chuck C and some of my sponsors talking about helping God's kids. You know, and uh, through if you've ever read the Bible and you see Daniel in the lion's den or Peter sitting there and the chain coming. You know, Gates open and the chains falling out. That's basically my story because uh, I was going through such a bitter divorce with, with my wife, Kim, and uh, that we weren't even allowed in the same room. There were restraining orders against me. I, I was that tornado, and I had torn everybody's heart out. You know, and you, I love it when people, because I'm guilty of it too, when I say I only hurt myself. That's the biggest crock of crap. I hurt more people than you can possibly imagine through my actions and attitudes. I didn't just hurt myself. We become like that tornado in everybody's lives. And, um, and, and we weren't, we, it was so damaged. She said to me one time, you know, Scotty, I don't even think God can fix this. And I said, well, it just shows how little faith you have. Now, I didn't really believe that, but it made her think, right? She's the one that's sober, right? And so I'm throwing these digs and she started a letter campaign and, and people all over the country wrote this judge, Chelsea McKay in the Lancaster Superior Court. And the bottom line is October 7th, 1997, he pulled me out of prison and he stood me in front of him. And he had his, all these papers on his gal, on his uh, bench. The gallery was full of people. And uh, he's looking at me and looking at these papers and looking at me and looking at these papers. And he says, I don't understand this. He says, you seem to have helped a lot of people in your life. He goes, I don't understand how you could do this to yourself. And see, what he didn't understand was the disease of alcoholism. He didn't understand how we could build this picture to our wives, our loved ones, our kids, our parents, our employers, and we all know the word, no, 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 this time I mean, no, no, give me one more chance. I'm going to do, I'm going to get sober this time. Give me one more chance. And then we tear the house down one more time and we drink. And if you ask the alcoholic, he usually, if he's honest, he doesn't know why. You know, he didn't understand these things, but for some reason, he, he felt that I didn't belong in prison. And, uh, he entertained a motion from the DA and all that, and they struck two of my strikes and released me the very next day with a five-year tail. Okay, and uh, I get out and I jump back into Alcoholics Anonymous, like my very life depended on it. Not ever with the thought that I would be up here again. Not ever with the thought that I would start doing a lot of stuff for Alcoholics Anonymous, trying to give so freely what had been given me, and that's my life back. Okay. Not ever with any of those hopes that I was going to get my wife or my children back or my businesses back or anything. I just didn't want to drink anymore. I wanted to try to help somebody. That's really the bottom line. I had to become teachable again. I had to wake up in the morning and get on my knees and pray that God removed everything I thought I knew about AA, everything I thought I knew about you people, and everything I thought I knew about life so that I could become teachable again. Because I had to become teachable. Okay. And when I started doing those things and, and, and I went through the prescription one more time, the promises started coming true for me again. I resembled that family. I got my businesses back. Um, I've traveled all over the country and out of the country. And, you know, a couple of things I'll talk about real quick. And I tell you this stuff not to impress you, but to impress upon you that the seriousness of this disease, that you too can become whatever you're capable of becoming, as long as you're honest and willing enough to try. Because I started doing God's work, going where God wanted me to go, saying what God wanted me to say, and that's my attitude, basically, is I say what he wants me to say, I go where he wants me to go and let the chips fall where they may. Um, I, I spoke after 9-11 at Congress, okay, at uh, the Capitol. And uh, my wife and I had uh, got invited by the Speaker of the House and had breakfast in the private dining of the Congress. Now, And I was on parole, and they never asked me, okay? <laughs> yeah, they never asked me. I wasn't going to tell them. I'm walking generals and senators and, and 
and admirals, and they're saying hi to me, sir, and stuff, you know, and, and I didn't tell them anything. They never asked. And I, I'm in the Ways and Means Committee room. It was a wonderful experience. Um, I took my fifth anniversary at the Vatican over in uh, Rome, Italy, and I gave a talk at St. Paul's Cathedral there, and uh, what an honor, okay? Those things are good, you know. Um, speaking at conventions all over are good. All that stuff is wonderful, wonderful memories, wonderful experiences, okay? But I also get in the trenches, okay? I have a home group, okay? I have commitments. I go into Herkimer County Jail. I go into the rescue mission. I sponsor people. I am sponsored by a man who's sponsored who follows God, okay? All these things I do, too, because it's not just any one. It's the service to recovery and the unity. It's our legacies is what they call them, okay? Um, some of the most memorable experiences that I've had, I'm going to tell you a couple of them real quick because i got some time, was at a food pantry, okay, in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And I went there, and yeah, this woman, she was 85 years old, and she was taking a 30-year medallion, okay, and she was talking about what it was like growing up as a white woman in the South, okay. And on their block, they had a, a mammy, and mammy was a big black woman, and all the kids in the neighborhood would go and sit on mammy's lap. And she remembered sitting on Mammy's lap when she was five years old, and she was rubbing Mammy's arm, and Mammy looked down at her and said, Child, child, my skin is as dark as the night, but my soul is as white as snow, just like yours. And now fast forward 50 years later, okay, in the grips of this disease, and talks about it in our book about women going to pieces quicker, okay, She's coming out of it, and, 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 and she's facing the terror, the bewilderment, the frustration, the despair. That's when we're coming out of it. That's when we're looking at our life. That's not when we're drunk. That's when we're looking at what we've done and, and, and all the havoc in our life. And she's feeling all these feelings, and she looked at her skin, and she had that moment of clarity. And, she's, and she remembered Mammy when she was five years old. And she cried out to God in that surrender. In that absolute surrender comes the release of the obsession, okay? And it's the conceding to the innermost self. And she looked at her skin and she remembered Mammy. And she said, my God, my God, my skin is as white as the snow. But my soul is as dark as the night. Help me, Father. You know, and he did. And that's one thing about God is he doesn't make too hard of terms on us, okay? It says in our book that it doesn't matter your race, your creed, your color. Each and every one of us is able to build this relationship with the loving God as long as two requirements are met. And that's if we're honest and willing enough to try. Yeah, you know, I went to Akron and, and um, I was in uh, with um, uh, Art Hoffman. And Art, Art just died a couple years ago. He had 59 years when he died. And uh, I was at the Kenmore group started by Bill Dotson and him. And uh, we were talking and my wife was there. And he looked at me and, and, he, and he says, how long, how, long you been, how long you been around? And I said, well, I've got four years sober now. He goes, no, 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 how long you been around? I go, well, a little bit of over 30, right? And he started laughing at me, right? He goes, what'd you learn? So I start telling him about, well, I learned about ego and arrogance and pride. He started laughing at me, right? And he goes, no, kid, you learned not to take the first drink. And I go, I go, oh, okay, right? People can't hear until they can hear and they can't see until they can see. Okay, right? And he goes, come here. And he takes me over to this desk and it's a round table. That's how the meetings were. They're all round tables. And uh, this guy was sitting there and he was like 80 years old. And he goes, this is so-and-so and he's got 18 months. So, you know, Mr. A.A., hey, it doesn't matter how old you are, you know, you can do this thing as long as you fall. And, I, and the guy goes, kid, and he holds up his hand. He goes, I had 25 years sobriety when I turned 70 years old. And he says, and I didn't think I needed you people because I didn't think I needed to do this anymore. And so I stopped coming. He goes, and I ended up drinking, and it took me five years to get back to get 18 months, right? And I'm looking at this guy who had in, Ak in Cleveland and Akron, and he, he had 25 years where it all started, right? And so the Art Hoffman's next to me. He goes, ask him what he learned. Ask him what he learned, right? And he starts elbowing me. So I said, well, can I ask you what you learned, sir? He goes, I learned not to take the first drink. I says, okay. See, we can color it in, in, in any way we want, but the thing is, is when, when what you're doing doesn't work anymore, drinking can't be an option, Okay. And that's what I had to learn, that drinking is no longer an option, period. Through my actions and attitudes, I may have be in jackpots and make some poor choices in my life, but drinking can't be an option anymore. It just can't be, okay? Because the alternative for me is jails, institutions, or death. And I don't want to go there anymore, you know? Um, I absolutely love the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I love the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I hope you... 
come to love the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. There's a story about this guy, because we got a lot of new people here, and we got Oregon is, is really taken off, and, and you've got a great structured group here, but you know, there's a lot of people that want to come into our, our program and our fellowship and change things, you know, and, and uh, they want to do different readings and do different things. And, you know, I learned this story um, about this farmer, okay, and this farmer had an old rooster, okay, and, you know, he, uh, the old rooster was getting tired and, and uh, in the barn, and he decided that he was going to replace it, and so he went out and bought one of those Rhode Island Reds with the long red beak and stuff, and he took this rooster and he put it in the in the barn in the hen house with the older rooster and he came walking in with his chest out and looking around and he sees all the chicks and he herds them over in the corner and this old rooster's looking at him and he goes up to him and says, hey, I, I know why you're here. You know, I, I know you're going to take over one day, but why don't you know, I've been doing this a long time. Why don't you let me show you how this farm works? And the young rooster didn't want anything to do with it, you know, and uh, just totally disrespect him. The old rooster goes back, and this young rooster's doing whatever he wants. Finally, you know, the young rooster goes, uh, the old rooster goes up to him and says, listen, I know you're going to take over, but please give me the dignity and the respect that I deserve. I've been doing this a long time. Let me show you how this works. And the young rooster didn't want anything to do with it. So finally, the old rooster goes up to him and says, okay, listen, I can't take this anymore. I want you to do me a favor. The young rooster goes, yeah, what's that? He goes, well, I, I'm going to go sit over here in this corner of the barn, and you go to that corner, and I'm going to yell, and I want you to start chasing me, and I want you to ke catch me, kick the shit out of me, and throw me out of the barn. That way I can walk out of here with a little simple dignity with my head held high. Okay? Don't come in here like you own this place and you're going to change everything. The young rooster goes, I can do that. So they go to opposite ends of the barn. The old rooster yells. That young rooster starts chasing him around the barn, right? Now, here's the farmer sitting in the house, and he hears all this commotion. He thinks that there's a, a fox in his hen house and stuff. He grabs his shotgun. He goes running out. He whips open the door, and he sees it. He goes, boom! And he shoots that young rooster dead, kills him. Just then, his wife comes running up and goes, what happened? He goes, it's the damnedest thing. That's the fourth queer rooster we've had in the last month. Okay? Now... Now, the, the, moral, the moral of the story there is watch out for some of these old-timers, okay? They're, no, they've been doing this a long time, okay, folks? I know, I know, as you know, and you know, and you know, you're the future of Alcoholics Anonymous. I am the future of Alcoholics Anonymous. We have a singleness of purpose here, that we need to be here for the still sick and suffering alcoholic who's going to come in these doors trying to find a better way for themselves. I was told to take the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and cut a suit out that was going to fit me because your suit might get me drunk. We have a blueprint in there that absolutely worked for those that are honest and willing enough to try. I'll leave you with this because I can literally talk forever <laughs> about Alcoholics Anonymous, okay? And this was something that meant so much to me because I was in prison and I got a hold of uh, um, this trap, okay? Well, f first... First, because we're always seeking, okay, and, and I loved it in the bathroom there where it talks about uh, have the courage and stuff because um, I read this book called Man's Search for Meaning, and it was written by this um, um, guy that was in a Nazi concentration camp, Auschwitz, and he talked about all the death and destruction around him. And out of the whole book, I got one little phrase, and what it said was that man need not be ashamed of tears, for tears bear witness that man has the greatest of courage, the courage to suffer, okay? And our book, our big book says that all men of faith have courage, okay? We don't, we don't apologize for our God, okay? And, and I read this thing that just absolutely blew me away, and I've never forgot it, and I'll leave you with this, that when you get what you want in your struggle for self, and the world makes you king for a day, just go to a mirror and look at yourself and see what that man has to say. For it isn't your father or mother or wife whose judgment upon you must pass. The fellow whose verdict that counts most in your life is the one staring back from the glass. He's a fellow to please, never mind all the rest, for he's with you clear up till the end. And you've passed the most dangerous, difficult test if the man in the glass is your friend. Some people may call you a straight shooting chum and call you a wonderful guy, but the man in the glass says you're only a bum if you can't look him straight in the eye. You may fool the whole world down the pathway of life and get pats on your back as you pass, but your final reward will be heartaches and tears if you've cheated the man in the glass. I cheated myself for a long time. I cheated myself for a long time, both in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't like my booze watered down. What do I want the program of Alcoholics Anonymous watered down for? 
This is the real deal here, and if you're an alcoholic, we have a common solution that we can absolutely agree upon, and I'd like to welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.